we're on. All right, well, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. We are still talking about spiritual gifts and signs and wonders. And tonight we're going to talk about just through the Bible, and the scriptures and stories we're going to talk about tonight are um, pretty much all with Jesus when he performed the miraculous and how people responded to that. So just responses to the miraculous. So why don't we pray? And uh, we'll get started. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy tonight. We thank you, Jesus, for all of your goodness, all the good things that you do for us. Your word declares that every good thing comes from you, God, and that you would not withhold any good thing from us. We thank you for that. We love you, God, that you are our provider, our protector, and our promoter. And we just lift up, Lord, your name tonight, and we lift up your church and our communities, God, and everyone joining us and watching this, that it would be a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so quick round table, square table. Uh, has anybody, we've talked a little bit about this before, but experience, um, not, we've talked about Jesus speaking to us or like something supernatural, but have you ever experienced the miraculous? And I guess that's kind of open, I don't want to say open to interpretation, but, you know, um, a lot of times when we think of miracle, we think of like, blind eyes opened or something like that but it it's uh there's no wrong answer tonight have you ever experienced the miraculous and how did you respond to that i'll start all right so when i was um actually just a young child my um i got really bad ear infections and so we my parents lived in indianapolis indiana at the time and they had felt a call to go to Germany. And they were very nervous, of course. The microphone's over here. You got to talk they this didn't way. Want to, <laughs> they didn't want to, um, you know, not knowing how parents was going to Germany and all those other things. And so um, my mom and dad took me, you know, to church and just believing. And, you know, I think even up to the altar for prayer. And I had a lot of scarring because I had so much drainage and everything that was in there. And they were going to try to put, you know, Tubes, tubes and everything in there and um that next time after they took me to the doctor after praying they said you absolutely do not need thinning tubing or anything because there's not any scar or anything it doesn't even look like you've ever had an ear infection and so from that time on i never have had an ear infection since so god is was good he answered a prayer and he knew my mom's concern getting ready to move to a foreign country and so, glory be to God. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Brother John? Uh, one time we were back in the old building. Uh, <coughs> we had this young man come in, and I've never seen dead eyes, but he had dead eyes. I mean, he just, there was no, no life in his eyes of, to me. And, and uh, he wanted God. Mm -hmm. He wanted the taste of it. And, uh, remember I got done leading prayer and he you know, reached for me and I and even Pastor Putnam later said, John, don't smother the man. You know? so, so, <laughs> but hey, he wanted it. So anyway, we, we prayed for him and prayed for him up there and, and uh, he even uh, wanted to go leave you know, and we almost physically stopped him and uh, but when he left after service he had life in his eyes yeah and I I know I I, I felt the evil that was in him. something was definitely was there, yeah. oppressing him and God God helped him through that yeah. night yeah and you could, and I, I, I don't know if anyone else but I could almost tell you when if, the, if there was a demon he it, it was when it left, left yeah because yeah. you could feel the the heaviness go away yeah yeah and that was powerful stuff that was very powerful yeah yeah so god can heal ear infections and god can deliver people if they were oppressed or even possessed of spirits amen um i remember for our son Seth, when he was 
born, the house we lived in uh, had some mold. It was a rental, and we didn't catch it, and he got sick at a very young age. He was med flighted at one to Madison, uh, one year old. And uh, I remember when we lived in Wapan, there would just be so many times where he would, in the middle of the night, it was always in the middle of the night, <laughs> he would start coughing. It was at the change of seasons. It wasn't activity-induced. It was like foreign body or something induced and I remember one night I just remember feeling really just I think overwhelmed by it and just tired of it and he was probably maybe three by then maybe three or four and I remember praying and I remember feeling definite confirmation not like a voice of God but I just feel I just felt a peace that God was going to heal him and and it wasn't instantaneous he still got sick but each time he did it was less and less and less and it's been I don't know how many years now you know since he's had any kind of treatment for any of that God has completely healed him from that asthma and he was I mean he had it pretty bad when he was young Uh, multiple Multiple uh, times yeah steroids and yeah when he was four months old he probably should he was in ICU in uh, Monroe And then he was in ICU in Madison for about a week at one year old. Um, Oh, inpatient Monroe. Okay. It was ICU in in Madison. Yeah. So it was just, but I just, I remember the the night of praying for him and just feeling a peace like he was going to be healed. And then the next time that he got sick, I remember not feeling disappointed, but just kind of wondering. And then I just felt like this is, it's going to happen. It's going to, you know, and each time we noticed, like, it was getting less and less and less. So sometimes God does something instantaneous, and sometimes he does it over time, you know, but he's still a healing God. So we believe that miracles still happen. Amen. And God working with his church, confirming his word, is very important for people's faith. Because when you hear those stories and you hear those testimonies, the Bible says, In Revelation, when the accuser of our brethren was accusing them day and night before the Lord, it says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives till the the death. So that word of their testimony was in there. There's no indication in the Bible that miracles and signs and wonders ever stopped, or they shouldn't still be happening today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And uh, so we're going to look at how people, we're going to look at some things that Jesus did and then kind of look at how people responded to the miracles because that's really the important thing, especially coming up to Pentecost Sunday. And, and not just that, but every service, we believe that God can do a miracle any service, whether it's healing, filling somebody with the Holy Ghost, um, deliverance, provision, whatever it might be. So... One of those that Jesus called to be one of his followers, his name was Nathaniel. If you remember Nathaniel in the New Testament. And in John chapter 1 and 45, Philip went and found Nathaniel. Philip was already following Jesus. And he said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel's first response was, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? It was obviously not a very impressive town. So not very many, you know, Academy Award winners or NBA players or uh, political figures, you know, not too many people coming out of Nazareth that were have accomplished or come to, to know anything in their life. And uh, Philip's response was just come and see. You need to check it out. And so Jesus sees Nathaniel coming to him. And he says, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. He's saying, here's an honest man. Here's somebody who's not deceitful. And he says that to him the first time they meet. Now, that must have been something that was very personal, like an important character trait for Nathaniel. Because Nathaniel said, he didn't say, oh, stop it. Oh, you're just just being nice. Oh, no, I'm not really that good. He says... From when do you know me? (laughs) So he must have been somebody who, in his character, had that 
determination that I'm going to be truthful, I'm going to be forefront, I'm going to be upright. And uh, Jesus said that. So Nathaniel asked, when do you know me from? And Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And his response was, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Because he said, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, we don't know when Philip or when Nathaniel was under the fig tree. We don't know that that part of the story. But obviously, when Nathaniel was under the fig tree, he was by himself. And th there wasn't anybody around. Um, and I'll just share this. And uh, this is the only uh, correlation I'll make with this because it's not in the scripture. But there's a series called The Chosen. And they do a really good job of creating a backstory to put a possibility of things that might have happened. So understand it's not scripture. The, the incident is in there where they meet, and he says, I saw you under the fig tree. But in this series, uh, Nathaniel was an architect, and something he built, he was having a hard time with this building, and he couldn't get the materials he needed. And then there was an accident, and he was afraid he was never going to work again. And so he goes, and he takes the plans he had drawn for a synagogue. He uh, in the story, he wanted to build synagogues. He wanted to create a place where people could get closer to God. Where He wanted to build tangible temples. And he's sitting under the fig tree. He burns the, the blueprints that he made. And he says, do you even see me? He's like, don't turn your back on me, God. Do you, do you even see me? And then Jesus comes up later and he says, when you're under the fig tree, I saw you. And it just created a really powerful moment. Now, I realize that that previous part was all fabricated, if you will. But they just created a reason why that that was there. So there must, because there must have been a reason, right? right. Have you ever been in a low place and maybe in prayer, maybe heaviness, um, and just pray, God, are you even there? Are you even there? And nobody else is around, and you're broken, and you're hurting, and then, you know, how would, how would you react if all of a sudden you saw somebody coming up to you that you didn't recognize and they said, I'm Jesus and I saw you when you were in your prayer closet and you wondered, you know, and, and I saw you when you were in that specific spot that nobody else could have known. And God still does that, right? Through his word. Many times, um, whether it's been myself preaching or we'll have a guest speaker come and they will preach right down they'll read somebody's mail we call it <laughs> right and they'll come up to me later and they'll be convinced that I said something to this guest minister who had never met him before that didn't know anything but God knows right. and that's what God is saying I see you in your darkest hour and Nathaniel's response to that was, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. What was his previous response? Can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> and now all of a sudden, just like that, he flips because Jesus saw him when he was, must have been in a low place um, or else it was something very personal with this fig tree, an event in his life or a time in his life. And Jesus says, when you thought you were all alone or when nobody else was there, I saw you. And that changes life. And that's, God still does that. Amen. Amen. And that's, that's what we need. That's happened so many times. Um, trying to minister to somebody or encourage somebody that maybe is going through something or struggling with something or got some questions for direction in their life. And God will, will, will have a guest speaker and they will almost talk right to that person you know and and it's god confirming saying i know i saw you because that person doesn't know right so that's the miraculous god giving somebody a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge ministering to somebody just as simple as i know where you're at and i know what you're going through amen so that's, that was a response to Miraculous, and Jesus still works that way. Um, this one here is a little more unique, and I don't know that, um, I guess, maybe some similar things. 
but Jesus' first miracle. Anybody remember what that was? The first one? one yeah, it's recorded as the beginning of miracles. I don't know that it was. I think there were some other things that he had done that could be considered miraculous. Um, but as far as being pub, in the public eye. So in John 2 and 6, there's a wedding feast and they ran out of wine. And for us, that might not be a big deal. But for them, culturally, there was a stigma that went along with that, right? And so Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes and she says, they're out of wine. He says, it's not my time. And she says, she turns to the servants and she says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So in verse 6, it says they were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. So there's these stone water pots that they would fill up the places where they would wash their hands and their feet when they would come in, right? So that's what the water was used for. It wasn't, I don't believe it was already used water. I don't believe it was dirty water. I believe it was a water used for the cleaning, uh, to my understanding. So Jesus said, take these pots, fill them with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, the person who's coming overseeing all of this wedding feast. And they did that. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not where it came from or what it was before, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and he said, every man at the beginning to set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, they bring that out. You know, so after your senses are a little dulled and your taste buds are no longer a clean palate, right? But you kept the good wine until now. Now, just think about, you know, that really wasn't the case because they ran out of their good wine. So they were already serving the good wine. And then what Jesus made was even better. And so it says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So that really encouraged the faith of the disciples, right? So sometimes Jesus does it for one individual that he's trying to minister to. Sometimes he does a miracle that's a little bit more private that nobody knows about except his inner circle. There might be some people coming together for a prayer meeting and they're praying specifically for something and God shows up and does it on Sunday and confirms it just for them, but nobody else knows that it happened. And nobody else needs to know that it happened because it was specific for his disciples. Amen. And the miracle wasn't that water was turned into wine because water's turned into wine every day because grapes drink water from the ground, right? But it was in the process of which it was done. <laughs> they, they bypassed the grapes and the root and the vine, right? But interestingly, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches, right? This one here is just a short verse, but the story of Nicodemus. And... Uh, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a Pharisee, one of the few that believed on Jesus. The other ones were all jealous of Jesus, but this must have been a humble man who truly loved God. In John 3 and 2, it says, the same came to Jesus by night. So here he gets a uh, late night meeting with Jesus. Probably for anonymity. Right. So either for his own or something, right? For some reason, they met in the middle of the night. And he said, Rabbi, we, I don't know who all the we is that he's speaking for, but he says, we know that you are a teacher, excuse me, come from God. For no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Sometimes it's for the confirmation of people that are really struggling and maybe won't even ever do anything about their faith. Right? So sometimes there's people who, who know without a shadow of a doubt that God has done something. Now, Nicodemus wasn't one of those, but the other Pharisees were, right? The other Pharisees 
saw the miracles, and we're going to talk about a couple of them, but they saw miracles happen. The fame of Jesus was all over the city, right? So Nicodemus is confirming we and likely referring to his group of religious leaders know that you are a teacher come from God because no one can do what you're doing unless God is with him. So sometimes the response might be I acknowledge that, but I'm too proud to do anything about it. But God still gives the opportunity, right? Every Pharisee, every religious leader, every one of them had the same opportunity that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had because they were both Pharisees. Whether there were others, I mean, he was in some Pharisee's house at times. I think Judas Iscariot's father was a Pharisee. I believe that that's where uh, the alabaster box was broken at that dinner. Um, So sometimes, even though somebody might not ever follow Jesus, but he still lets them know that he's real. That's a pretty powerful one. Uh, Another one, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Anybody remember anything specific about that encounter? Told her her life. Told her. Told her. Right, and she responds by saying, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. (laughs) (laughs) And so she leaves her water pot, goes her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? So she had a powerful experience. Whatever it is, that Jesus did you had five husbands and the one you're with now is not your husband so you've said that truly you don't have a husband so through the words and the conversation that they had this woman was convinced that he was the Christ and she went and told the people of her city and it says in verse 39 and many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman so here's which testified he told me all that I ever did So here's a woman, I don't know what her method was, I don't know how she said it or what all she said to him, but here's a woman who even probably in the Samaritan culture does not have a very good rapport, right? She's had five husbands and the one she's with now is not her husband. So she comes and the people of the city believed because of her testimony. That's pretty powerful. The miraculous incident in her life not only changed her, but it it began to impact her city. So when the Samaritans were come, verse 40 says, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he stayed there two days. And verse 41 says, many more believed because of his own word. Was she some kind of prominent, or just a woman at the well? And all of a sudden just... uh... Um, or did everybody know about her because I think it would be the other way around instead of rather the most the, the mayor of your city giving a testimony it'd be the, the lowest of the low of your city yeah yeah and having that testimony um, and, and I'm sure I'm not saying that you know people have struggles right people have real problems and they make real mistakes and she had made real mistakes, just like everybody does. But something, and, and, and sometimes, see, as humans, we grade things, right? You know, if somebody made these mistakes, then they're kind of right here. But if you made these mistakes, then those are a little bit worse. So the higher the scale of the mistake, the lower you go <laughs> in rapport, really. But and what's that? But, but to God. But to God. Sin is sin, and the blood takes care of all of it. And Jesus said, you know, he had a conversation with her that he was the Messiah, and he must have done something uh, to let her know that, kind of like the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, he said, I don't condemn you. 
she must have felt the same way, that here is somebody who's a Jew speaking to a Samaritan and not condemning her, knowing her life. So she had that testimony. And then after they believed because of Jesus' word, 42 says, they said to her, now we believe, we still, we, we believe before, but now we believe differently, not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know indeed that this is the Christ, the Savior of the world. So it's almost like their faith went from here to like up here. She impacted them through her testimony of the miraculous that Jesus did just by telling her about herself. So they obviously had to be hungry. Well, I think that um, even the Samaritans were probably tired of Roman rule and wanted, wanted the Messiah to come and deliver them, you know, um, even though they weren't full, fully Jewish people. So... They were, they, they were obviously hungry. They were looking for, looking for something. And then when they go in and he stayed there for two days ministering to the people and they believed even more because of the words of Jesus. So, again, a response to the miraculous. Now let's look at something that's more in line of miracles of how we, our flesh likes to see miracles. Because that, that's, you know, that's incredible. That's that's emotional, but when we see something physical trans transpire, that affects us, I think, a little bit differently. So there was a man with an unclean spirit, and this is interesting to me. It's in Mark 1 and 23 is where I'm going to start reading. It says, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. And I'll just stop there for a minute because what, what situations had he done before in that synagogue? Had he caused, you know, was he just somebody that they said, okay, we're just going to, you know, kind of, we, that's the elephant in the room we're not going to talk about, right? They were in the synagogue. The Pharisees, the religious leaders were there. And there was a, Jesus was in the synagogue, and there was a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, and he said, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So I think for these people in the synagogue, these Pharisees and religious leaders and whoever else was there, I don't think that they were shocked by the fact that this man had an unclean spirit. I think that they probably knew. Was that let us alone? Is that the, the congregation or is that the unclean spirit? That's the spirit. Yeah, that's the man with the spirit. He but cried well, out. But, but, yeah, but is it the spirit crying out, let us alone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the man didn't know. The spirit that he was possessed by knew who Jesus was. Yeah. But the man didn't know. So... But the man was completely, I mean, if he was that far possessed with the spirit speaking through him, kind of like the man of the Gadarenes who we're going to talk about, um, then it must have had some control over him physically, right? To be able to cause him to say that and to give him that knowledge. And Jesus rebuked him saying, hold your peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him, there's obviously some physical demonstration that happened, right? whether he flopped on the ground or whatever it was, he cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they, the rest of the people in the synagogue, were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, what thing is this? <laughs> what new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. So they knew the man had a spirit. But what could they do about it? Obviously nothing, because they hadn't done anything about it. And immediately it says his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And this is another part that amazes me, that there were religious leaders in the synagogue. There had to have been. 
Pharisees, Sadducees, whoever, and they still did not believe him. Or did nothing. Or did nothing about their belief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It tells us many times in the Bible that they were jealous of him. He drew crowds, and they got jealous of that because people weren't coming to hear them anymore. People were wanting to follow Jesus. Pride of life. Right. right, the pride of life. But it says they were amazed, and what new doctrine is this? And immediately his fame spread all throughout the region. We need Jesus' fame to spread again. There's too many people in our community who don't know who he is or anything about him, that he can change lives, that he can heal, that he can deliver, that he can bless, that he can give peace and hope. Yes. That's, uh, people need hope. Right? People need hope. They need, they need blessings uh, of peace in their life. They need uh, direction. And, and sometimes we want to say answers, but it's not always that we need answers to everything, but we need to n- trust in the one who has the answers. Because it's not always the fact that God is going to tell us exactly what to do so we can get out of the situation, but he might give us leading of his spirit to get through the situation. Our, our communities, our, our country, people need hope. They need to know that there is a God that can give them joy and peace and that he loves them and that he's willing to forgive them and that his blood that he shed on Calvary can cover their sins. First, they need to understand that they have sinned and that there is a God and that because we're human, we have done things to, to, to displease him. Not that he doesn't love us, but he loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us as we are. So his fame spread. We need his fame to spread. Amen. Um, do you remember when Simon and Andrew and James and John were first called? They were fishing, right? And Jesus was teaching on the shore. Peter had been fishing all night, caught nothing. And so now Jesus says, hey, mind if I teach out of your boat? <laughs> Whatever, I'm tired, do whatever you want. <laughs> gets in the boat he teaches he gets done teaching he says hey let's go fishing push out a little bit and let down the nets i mean he was they were already cleaning right Mm -hmm. they were getting ready they were done he had given it all night now i fished for a long time before casting and i don't uh i have a friend that fishes for for muskies and muskies are called the fish of ten thousand casts because you just got to keep casting and keep casting and keep casting. When I fish, I bobber fish. I cast and I keep looking and keep looking and keep looking. <laughs> but fishing with a net, to throw that net out and to let it sink and to pull it back up through, I have a swimming pool that I have to clean sometimes, and just pulling it through the weeds and getting the junk out of it and, oh. Their arms must have been like rubber bands in the morning. I can only imagine. And, uh, all right, at your word, I'll let down one net. Jesus said, let down the nets. And Peter said, I'll let down a net. I'm <laughs> not getting them all there. I'm not doing this all again. So he threw it out, and it enclosed such a great multitude of fish. The net began to break, and they had to call out to their partners that were in the other ship. Come and help. They came. They filled both ships so that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. <laughs> and when Peter saw it, this had never happened before, obviously, for this man who'd been fishing his whole life. And he knew that this was a miracle. And so the immediate response is not joy, is not go out and tell everybody but it's falling down at his feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. Sometimes the response to the miraculous is just worship and humility, and rightfully so. When Jesus does something, no matter what it is, you know, somebody else might, might Peter could go and tell that story to, to, uh, 
to the horse chariot repairman down the street who's not a fisherman, who has no idea, and say, this happened, he could be like, so what? <laughs> well, he said what, he said what I think most people would say. I've fished all day or I fished all night and not caught anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Right. But at your word. Yep. Yeah, at your word. It, it's think of something that you do that a tr a, a yeah. trade you know or something that you know and and you have you know done it every which way from Sunday, and it's just not going to work. You know, I have tried to get this, you know, whatever it is, you know, uh, you know, from a mechanic's point of view. You ever have that one bolt and nut that you're trying to reach, and you just no matter which way you try to get, <laughs> you can all the, time. <laughs> all the time. You just cannot get on it, right? Or maybe it, it won't start. That's my basic. <laughs> oh, getting you one to start. Get, yeah. Get it you know, just something like that that you can relate to. And this was that for Peter. He says, you know, catching fish wasn't the miracle. It was the way it happened. That he had been out all night where they should have been. And now he throws out his net one time and so many fish that he can't even pull it in. And his response was one of humility. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. That should be our response every time, no matter how great the miracle. God is doing something. We should, in humility, worship him. We should bow down physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, humble ourselves before him. Um, another great story, and we'll just do a couple more here because we could, we could go on all night. Um, <laughs> I think that if everything Jesus ever did, the world itself couldn't contain the books that were written. That last week. <laughs> so the palsy, the man who could not walk, he was a paralytic. His friends come. He, they're each carrying one corner of his bed. They couldn't get to where Jesus was because so many people were there. So they go up on the roof and they begin to peel apart the roof so they can fit this man down through. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. And of course... There were certain scribes there. Now, they, why they were there, I don't know. He must have been teaching a while for this to spread around, right? And so they're saying, they're thinking in their minds, in their hearts, who can forgive sins but God? They didn't say it out loud. And immediately, he looks at them and says, why do you reason these things in your heart? And they're probably like, well, I'm not reasoning anything in my heart. <laughs> Is it easier to say your, son, your sins be forgiven or to say arise and take up your bed and walk? And they're like, oh, you mean that, <laughs> right? And so he said, so you know I have power on earth to forgive sins. Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he, he gets up, he takes the bed, he walks out of there, and they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw it on this fashion. We, we, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, when when he healed when he cast out the demon in the synagogue this what new doc what new thing is this he's doing things we have never heard of before and there are people that that have never heard even some of the most familiar things to us things that are so familiar to us that have been born again or that have gone to church or who've been raised to know Jesus or have read the Bible or studied it, there's people that don't know anything about him. That on things that we could say, oh yeah, I've, I've, I've seen something similar to that before, they would, their minds would just be blown. So we see this as, when they were amazed and glorified, God said we never saw it in this fashion. We always think that it's got to be something we've never seen before for that to happen. But for Jesus, it was no big deal, right? He knew it. So it's always relevant to the people there experiencing it. It, it could be something that maybe we've experienced before uh, or seen God do before, something similar. But there could be somebody brand new who's saying, man, I never knew, I never knew Jesus cared this much. I never knew he, he interacted with lives this way. And that's what people need to see and to know. Um, all right. We can cover. 
Well, we just got one more. We'll just talk about the demoniac of the Gadarenes. So, Jesus and his disciples in Mark chapter 5, they cross over the Sea of Galilee, and they come to the country of the Gadarenes. Uh, this is a different area. And just from the fact that there were people there watching pigs and tending to wild pigs tells us this was not a Jewish community, right? Right. So this was the other side of the tracks for them, right? This was the side where they don't normally go. So imagine just when when they're in the boat, you know, and you're out and you don't always realize where you're going, but Jesus knew where he was going. And when they get there and they see where they're at, Right. <laughs> so, what's their response? What are we doing here? Sometimes God wants to do the miraculous for somebody, and we're like, why are we here? Because of our human perspective sometimes. Because we like, we like the easy situations. We like the easy testimonies. We like the easy Bible studies. We like the, you know, to, to help people who don't have any problems. <laughs> you know, Tony, in every one of these uh, demon, uh, demon, what do they call that? Possession. Possession. There must be a, still enough of that person there to... Mm-hmm. No, I gotta go to Jesus. Yeah. Sorry. Well, the Bible even says that even with the Holy Ghost, that the the prophets, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So that meaning that you may be used in the gifts of the spirit, but that doesn't mean that it's it's overpowering you to the point where you can't. You know, you could be filled with God's spirit and presence and be speaking in tongues and feel like this could just go on forever. But any minute, if you wanted to, you could shut it off. But I think that it, you, we don't because we're submitted to him. So I think that there's always a level of submission to spiritual things. Just like there is with God, there's still a level of submission to yeah. spiritual things, right? And I think that there is always... So you have to let it you 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 well i don't know that people get into it saying this knowing the end result and i want this to happen well the devil made me do it you know that yeah i think it starts with flesh and temptation of the flesh and we open ourselves up to things yeah um and we don't often realize where it's gonna take us because then when you see the person you know who is whether it's drug addiction or, or whatever it is in their life is just a mess. I don't think they ever, ever started out thinking, this is this is my goal, you know? Yeah. Takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you want to pay, right? So man with an unclean spirit, again, comes out of the tombs. He lived there. He cut himself, and... Think of this, even this miracle on the negative spiritual side. He was bound with chains. and fed- How people got chains on him, I don't know. But he broke them apart. He picked the fetters and the chains apart. He ripped them apart. So that spirit gave him strength and power to some degree. Right? I mean, you can't break chains unless you're... You know, and I think that a lot of times, even in our world today, we blame it on other things. And but I think that those things are sometimes just a gateway into that spiritual, whether it's drugs or or witchcraft or whatever it might be. But you see people who just get so crazed that they can they have supernatural strength. You see that with law enforcement encountering those types of people all the time. They can shoot them with a taser multiple times and it doesn't really affect them. And I think of this man kind of in that way. The fetters were broken in pieces. No man could tame him. Nobody could could handle him. Night and day in the mountains, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself. But when he saw Jesus, he ran and worshipped him. Afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And that's just too where the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Even the demons are subject to him. 
So, and he says, what do I have to do with thee? Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. That's the spirit speaking. And he said, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he says, what is your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. So then they're like, send us into the swine, right? And so he gave them leave. They entered in the swine. They ran violently down the hill. There were about 2,000 pigs choked in the sea. And the people that fed the swine, <laughs> they got out of there. <laughs> they hightailed it. And they told it in the city and in the country. They went out to see what was done. They came to Jesus. They saw the man possessed, and he was sitting there clothed and in his right mind. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's, isn't it funny how many people use terms where they don't know where that term came from? Right. Clothed, and in right mind. clothed and in your right mind. My mom used that term on me a lot when I was a kid. <laughs> um, and they told him what happened. And so they wanted Jesus to leave. I mean, they were freaked out. And when he was coming to the ship, the man that had been possessed said, I want to go with you. He prayed that he might be with him. And what did Jesus say? Now, I think part of this is because of the cultural thing and because of God's plan of Israel being his nation, right, his chosen people. And this man was not, an, not a Jewish individual. So it wasn't time for those things to happen yet. But he said, go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for you and had compassion on you. And he departed and began to publish it in Decapolis, how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. And just a little recap, back when we did the seven churches in Revelation on Wednesday night earlier in the year, when I got to the church in Philadelphia, what I never realized before was Decapolis was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, but it's a whole region. And Philadelphia, the only church that got the real good accolades in, in Revelation on those letters to seven churches is at the southernmost region of Decapolis. So could it be, could it be that they knew about Jesus and became a church in the New Testament because of this man's testimony? Yeah. I don't know. But it's pretty powerful to think about. So we can see how important miracles and signs and wonders are for the spreading of his word. And he's still able to do those things through each and every one of us. So next week we're going to look at um, how people responded to the disciples who did these miracles in his name. So miracles are important for initiating and at times increasing our faith, and so is the word of God, right? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and also when God conforms his, confirms his word. Amen. So miracles, signs, and wonders, we need to continually pray that Jesus will use us in the gifts of his spirit. Amen. <laughs> you can end it. <laughs>